My name is Garrett Kennedy and my background is in sculpture. And I suppose just to kind of start, um, just to kind of give a few kind of thank yous, uh, first and foremost to Liam and the Heritage um, uh, Council for bringing us together and having us co-mingle. I think that's really, really important. It's, it's turned into a very eclectic uh, conference and I'm starting to really buzz off it. So thank you for that. A couple of more just... Um, some logos just with reference to kind of some of the projects I'm going to present. So here we have the Arts Council, which is not unlike the Heritage Council in terms of uh, being publicly funded, funded, also having quite a long arm from uh, direct governance, so it's kind of peer reviewed. And a lot of my work and a lot of the work of my peers is funded through the Arts Council. It's just, it's just a really extraordinary peer reviewed uh, way of uh, um, funding ambitious cultural projects. Um, then I have a, like, a kind of local art, arts, or regional arts centre here in Eris in Belmullet, Eris in Ishtlora. Um, there's another logo I couldn't find for a very uh, specific community centre called Dunquikon Dun um, Dun um, Kora Cho. Um, so just a shout out to them. And then finally, two, two logos. I don't know two, who knows their county council logos. So that's, a, that's an interesting. On the left, we have um, Mayo. And on the right, um, I'm a little bit disappointed in Dearman if he's here. It's County Kerry. Um, so just to begin with, this is a slide I've used to kind of introduce my practice um, for several years now. This is from a very iconic series of 37 films made by David Shaw and Sally Smith um, uh, from the late 1970s into the early uh, and mid-1980s called Hands. Um, so these 37 films captured different kind of handcrafts, economies, uh, modes of production that were right in the age of obsolescence, right in the age of being kind of lost to the modern world, to, to march modernity. And I'm really, really interested in these. I'm really interested in these as, as a kind of significant contribution to anthropology, not just in an Irish context, but certainly in a European context. Um, these films capture things like car traditional carpet making, uh, weaving in Donegal, uh, letter work, cooperage, so on and so on. And I suppose I'm very, very interested in this as a contemporary sculpture because um, not from a, a sentimental or nostalgic point of view, but I'm, I'm interested in the social agency of hands, making things by handwork in the early 21st century, which of course is a time where we're more and more digitized, more and more touchscreen based, less and less using our opposable thumbs or our grip and kind of arguably, in some cases, like at a greater remove than ever from the, from the production of things, and making things, and being involved in things. So it's, it's kind of something I just very specifically look at, uh, is uh, handwork, and the almost the anachronism of making things by hands, to try and get a grip on quite complex, interesting times. So I'm going to present two projects. Uh, Two projects. I'm going to one rather quickly, and the other more specifically. Uh, it's a great privilege and a challenge for me to present to a room of predominantly archaeologists. It's a real test of of the work. Um, so um, we'll see how it goes. This is this is a this is an initial work made in a place called Guinea Guilla or Guinea Gole in the Schlieve Lucras in County Kerry. It's a, it was a public art commission for a village of about 500 people. And the village already had two bronze artworks in it. So that was, that's a, that's a lot of bronze public art for one village of 500 people. So there was an appetite there to do something different. So what I proposed to do was to invent a contemporary tradition for the village, make an experimental material culture, and then perform that locally and make a film of that, not unlike David Shaw Smith but that that film that we would make wouldn't be a documentary, it would be a thing called a folk fiction, which is essentially where the people in the film were kind of colluding in the production of the film and an understanding of it. So what we have here on the left, this is 2011. 2011 Ireland is in the depths of recession. Uh, Guinea Guilla is not untouched by this. Uh, on the left we have a housing estate, an unfinished housing estate empty housing estate, and this was quite a, a motif of the crash, wasn't it? Like small towns, villages, book ended with empty housing, unfinished housing after the crash. So this was the kind of location for the production of this work, 
And coupled with that, you have the phenomenon of IKEA, and this is just as hopefully relatable to Benjamin. Uh, IKEA relate, um, arriving in Ireland in 2009. And what I set up was uh, one of these houses became a, 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 a workshop, and two IKEA tables were, were brought there and um, cannibalized and, and reformed into new, uh, new old material culture. So from one table and one shelving unit, we got the largest tabletop butter churn you could make. And I suppose this, this relates to where this is, the, the landscape in, in Kerry in the southwest. It's the Gulf Stream. It's got a long and deep history of pastoralism, literally going back thousands of, thousands of years, going all the way up to the contemporary global phenomenon that is curry gold. So the idea of this invented tradition was we would build something from an IKEA uh, table and then have this almost ritualized event, invented tradition. Everyone in the village was invited down to the house, through the house, to uh, collectively spin a massive uh, well, about, I don't know, 20 pounds of butter, um, which was then packed into a so-called firkin, which you see in the bottom right corner there, which was, um, you know, kind of relates to the kind of history of the butter roads and butter production of that area. Um, so the, the firkin of butter, when it was full, we didn't put it on a donkey and cart to bring it to Cork, to the old butter market and so on. It wasn't a, wasn't a period drama. Uh, we, 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 we took a left in the road and we went, to the, we went to the local bog where we buried the Ikea firkin full of butter um, to create what I'm, I'm very interested in anachronism. I'm very interested. To be anachronistic, kind of as a contemporary artist, is, is a bit of an insult. You're out of time, you're in the wrong place, you're doing the wrong work, the wrong place in the wrong time. But I'm interested in anachronism. So what we have here is the IKEA butter uh, firkin, and there it is in good company with other bog butters from the National Museum of Ireland, some of which date back to 500 BC, uh, the youngest of which I think dates to somewhere maybe in the early 1700s. So that's an extraordinary like 2,000 year plus history of people burying butter in bogs across Ireland. And here we have, voila, like this anomaly or something, uh, aberrate, an ab abnormality within the archaeological record, which is a bog butter from 2012, an Ikea, um, an Ikea wooden, probably Russian birch wood uh, time capsule to be put, put in the bog to be maybe discovered in the future. And in the future, hopefully, we'll still have archaeologists, and hopefully, uh, they'll have fun, some fun with this. So um, that's an example of one work, but the work which I really want to kind of focus on a little bit more, because it's a live work, it's an active work, I'm still working it out. So this is a kind of opportunity for me to air some uh, research. And this is called Tirasalia. And it's an Urus from Northwest Mayo. So what we here, have here is a kind of JPEG relic from the early years of the, the internet. Uh, these things are go fast going out of fashion. And this is Northwest Ireland. I'm sorry I don't have a bigger map to show people where it is. What we have here is a um, public art project that was launched in 1993. And it was to celebrate Mayo 5000 which was to celebrate no less than like 5,000 years of inhabitation in County Mayo. And the idea behind these original, these original commissions was that the work would last another 5,000 years. So mark 5,000 years, but still needs to be around in 5,000 years. Rather ambitious, and what you get there is a lot of land art, a lot of earth art, a lot of like stone, a lot of, a lot of mon megaliths. Um, so last year I was commissioned along with two other artists to kind of revisit the, the Tearsalia commissions on the 25th year anniversary and more modestly to make work that would maybe reflect in the last 25 years but be present in, in another 25 years. Just to kind of reference very quickly where the Mayo 5000 comes from, it relates to uh, the Cajun Fields, which is... Um, uh, 
archaeologists like Seamus Caulfield have, have done huge work on this, what is effectively like the oldest um, uh, farming wall system uh, in the world preserved. So this, this, this opened this interpretive centre and there's a field system that spreads back through the bogs. This opened in 1993. So it was a kind of like keystone in this Mayo 5000 celebration thing. And this is, a, this is an awkward moment where I try and explain the cage of fields to a room full of archaeologists. Um, very much out of my depth. For, for those that don't know, um, what we know about this, this civilization, these first farmers, these Neolithic farmers, is they came, they arrived, they probably cut down the trees that were there, uh, they planted their seed, they organized their field systems, they brought their animals, they enjoyed about four or five hundred years in the sun, good times. The weather changed, the climate changed, it became much wetter, um, the land became waterlogged, the only thing that would grow was moss, the only thing that would grow on top of moss was more moss. This gave us the bog, it buried their field systems. Uh, and, and the kind of rule of thumb is for every metre of bog, you've got like about a thousand years of aggregated uh, bog. So what we have here is a diorama from the interpretive centre, and you can see like the, the bog wood there, um, which, you know, we'll, we'll come back to how the bog wood came about. So I was placed in a very particular kind of place in, in relationship to kind of Earth, this North Mayo and to revisit a very particular commission. Um, um, so the area I was put into was called Carroll Haig. Uh, that's the Irish fort. It's a Gaeltoc, uh, so people still speak the Irish language there predominantly every day. The language is in trouble. Uh, it's not being transmitted effectively. There is, there is a good chance they'll die out in a generation or two. It'll be a terrible loss. It's a very, very particular dialect. Um, and you can see here, you can see here on Google what the commission from 1993 or 94 was, a work by an artist called Walter Michael. And it's like this inscription in the land, like a mound of kind of organized stones, um, which in this case is referring to the name of the peninsula, which is Dun Quichon. Who is Quichon? Quichon was a mythological Celtic cyclops. So a one-eyed being that somehow gave his name to this peninsula. Other particularities about Dun Quicon. This is a book from 1975. It's by uh, UCD, uh, a folklorist called Seamus O'Caha. Uh, the Living Landscape, Kilgallagan, Earth, County Mayo. And what's extraordinary and very interesting about this book is, is uh, it tracks microtoponymy. Microtoponymy being a fancy name for the names, naming of small places. So O'Cahan, what with his lead informant in the area, so it was in the 1970s, uh, his lead informant was a guy called John Henry, who was monolingual, only spoke Irish, and also illiterate, but had an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge of this landscape, knowing all these hundreds of names, but also knowing the, the story behind these names, the, 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 the economic, historical, cultural, environmental, mythological import behind all these names. And therefore, O'Cahan posits that this was a kind of, a, a kind of pre-Gaelic uh, understanding of kind of landscape. Or, or sorry, a Gaelic, so excuse me, Gaelic pre-famine, uh, pre-literate understanding of landscape, which is the oral tradition. So if you have access to these names and you understand the, the, the providence and the stories behind them, it, the landscape becomes an encyclopedia for you to kind of understand and look at. So very, very interesting research for me. It's, a, it's an incredibly interesting read. Just This is Seamus sitting on the curragh, on, on, uh, the guy in the red jumper is John Henry. This is from a rather extraordinary um, documentary called In Search of the Trojan War by the BBC from 1985. And this is on YouTube for you to watch, I'd recommend it. And this is John Henry basically regaling Seamus with uh, a kind of Gaelic version of the Odyssey. Um, so, pretty extraordinary. How does this man in the northwest of Ireland have this Gaelic version of Homer's Odyssey? How did it get there? 
why did it get there? And um, just, just, just a curiosity. A curiosity sets the, sets the mind and the imagination racing. Um, it's, it's fair to say Seamus, who's working on me with the, on this project, he's probably spent 20 years constantly gathering stories just from this peninsula. Um, he's, got, he's got, you know, 10 years of research just on John Henry. Every, every summer he would go and um, the questions would be, would be, you know, there'd be more stories. So what was my proposal there? My proposal there was, was twofold. It was to connect centralized archaeological research and archives and specialisms with what's called the genus loci of a place. That is to say, like the kind of understanding and the intelligence of people that live in a landscape, what they have. So my first port of call was to go to the National Museum and to look at all the bog finds, to build a kind of register or an index of all the archaeological finds from the area um, that were dug out of the bog in this case. So this is a kind of you know, about 16 or 18 articles of things that have been found over the last 100 years in the bog, either by industrial processing by Bornemona or by small, smaller localised kind of handwork. And we got interesting things there. We've got five or six bog butters, and that's one of them there. So for me to get my hands in a bog butter, having buried a bog butter seven years before, um, it's nice. It, feel, it feels good. So... <laughs> I'm going to fly through this, um, kind of a theory of everything. <laughs> I'm shocked I have only five minutes left, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> this, is me, this, is, this is me on holidays in Sicily, and what have we got here? We have a dwarf elephant, and what we have here is, again, a, a much larger kind of proposition, which is a Dinotherium giganticum. So this is another kind of proto-elephant that roamed the earth seven million years ago. So we need to kind of consider the first farmers being also the first archaeologists. When they're digging in the ground, they're finding, um, they're digging up things and they need to make stories about them. So when they find these one-eyed orf, this kind of, these skulls with this kind of orifice in the middle, you know, there's a theory that this posits that this is where the one-eyed uh, being comes from, the cyclops. And they say if the kind of, if you track like the one-eyed being, the cyclops is, is, is a kind of myth that is as old as agriculture, which is a kind of curiosity. I'm going to jump into modern times. Um, this is we're back in Eris here. This is the industrial uh, Bordemona plant, board, uh, burning peat. Um, and this is it discontinued in the year 2006. And uh, of course, all bog cutting will be discontinued under EU law by 2030. I am showing that just because I like the way the bog is swallowing up. Who will find it in the future and what will they make of it? Um, something about industrial uh, processes. Very efficient at doing one thing, but hopelessly inefficient at other things. Creates lots of waste and waste material. So what we have here is a, neo, is, is a kind of pine wood forest that, that, that came, and came back to this landscape after several hundred years after the fall of the cage of field civilization. So the weather shifted again, and pine trees came back. They grew, the weather shifts again, the bog comes back, the trees rot where they, what, what, rot where, where they stand, where they, where they stand. So the humans didn't cut them down, they rotted and died in the ground. That's very often where we have the bog stumps kind of preserved. So this is a pollen analysis. I'm not gonna go into that, I don't have time. But that kind of red dot there is where we're looking at. Um, so what I did with this pro project, I basically blew my materials budget um, harvesting bog pine. Taking it out, my reckoning is this stuff, you know, there won't be a lot of this stuff dug, you know, in the future in this landscape. So I reclaimed this material and I planed it and I've cleaned it down and I now have a raw material to make a material culture out of. The vision being to return to the area, to make something a material culture, an experimental material culture, and to bury it in the bog, and then dig it up in 25 years. So it's kind of like a reverse engineered experimental archaeological dig. So this is a kind of fieldwork image of me, <laughs> you know, on the bog the last summer, trying to work out, you know, working with people with turbary rights in the area. What will we make? What will we bury? What, what will be meaningful for us to bury now and dig up later. 
Um, the elephant in the room, of course, you can imagine uh, this time last year I had to present this kind of project, having done six weeks uh, research in, in Eris, um, and presented to a mixed audience of, of uh, community, uh, people from the community, but also the art world. And this was three weeks before that Tearsolyak Symposium. And what we have here is a, is a flaring of, of, of gas. So uh, there was a refinery in the area. It, it released um, a lot of gas without the odour in it into the Irish system. Uh, so people of Ireland get canaries for your kitchens. Uh, the gas had to be returned to the area and then flared off for three kind of days. Um, so it was a kind of, kind of not a nice thing to have in your landscape. And then kind of coupled with that, you know, this kind of what I found on the ground there is, is, is people that are rendered, divided, fatigued, uh, and exhausted by 16 years of civil strife in the area. Um, and how to work with them, and how, how do you work with the last 25 years when 16 of those years were, were caught up in this, this, this civil strife, which was, you know, people... People are pretty wounded by it and pretty divided. It being rural Ireland, memory is long. Memory will be intergenerational. The memory of this, the divides will continue. And, you know, an amazing uh, challenge for me. What do you do? What, what do you do? You can't mention the war. And the worst thing you could possibly do is arrive and spend six weeks in the area and then open up this gap. So you can't mention the war, but you have to acknowledge it. So the question is, how do you do that? So, I don't know, you can, imagine, you can imagine the situation I was in, like having to acknowledge this civil strife, but not being able to talk about it. And being in a symposium with people, and, and they were thinking, oh, his presentation was going so well, and now the feckin' Egypt's going to bring up the GAS. You know, and we're not ready, and we can't talk about this, and we can't, we don't have language in this, and it's raw and it's scar tissue, and we're traumatized, and language and words isn't enough. So, you know, this is the kind of solitaire, real Leviathan, it's the largest, it's a deliberately blurred image. So you can imagine I was at this point, and the atmosphere changed in the symposium, and I was, I was kind of fortunate, you know, I was, I was, I was interrupted, and it, and it was an interjection. And, you know, the, the whole kind of question with this kind of project is what form do we take? What, what, what form do we take? And then for me to make work with people, you know, no people, no art. So how do I get people involved? And that's still a process to, that needs to be evolved. But I suppose at this moment, I was kind of, I was fortunate because somebody ran into the room and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Gaelic dialect interrupted me and shut me the hell up. So I'd say nothing more about the gas and just heckled me and mitered me and just, just shut me up. And I'm, I'm not going to perform the mask because I'm, I'm not equipped to it and it's not my voice. But um, she, then, she then turned on the audience and just had a good go at them. And just ask Gaelic in Irish, had a go at them for their ecological like, short-sightedness, for being a kind of e ecocidal apes and kind of ruining the planet and what are you at? Why did you dig me out of the bog in the first place? So it's an angry mask. She was furious. That's her there. Um, um, but it saved me from having to talk about the GAS. I was, I, was, I was lucky that day, you know. And here I am again, and I'm kind of talking about it, because this is evolving. It's easier to talk about it at a distance, but when you're there, it's just such raw material. It's just such raw. It's the unspeakable. Everyone knows about it, but it's, the, um, it's, it's taboo to talk about this stuff. So I'm returning there. I've got Arts Council funding to continue the project, which is great. Because before a lot of people wouldn't talk to me because it was a it was a county council project, so it was council money. And a lot of people up there are done with the council, you know, they're just they just had it up to here, you know. Um, they've lost all trust and faith in institutions. And um, you know, this has to continue to evolve. What will we make? What will we put in the bog? And when will we dig it up? And when is pertinent, when is meaningful? So just to kind of plot tickens, I'll just finish on a wee anecdote here. Of, this is a man called Dominic Trimble in Offaly. Dominic is an earnest, very serious woodcutter. He's cut a lot of wood 
in his time. And he's the man that milled my uh, Eris Bogwood. And uh, so Dominic rings me, and he's very excited. And that's unlike him. So Dominic uh, has hit a hollow in the wood, and 200 acorns or so have fallen out of it. And the acorns are germinating. Uh, so there's two ways you can go when that happens. You can go romance, or you can go scientific. And Dominic, and I'm surprised to his credit, he went for the romance. That basically, if these are preserved acorns from 4,000 years old, this is world news. This is the Discovery Channel. This is, uh, this is the National Geographic. And I'm kind of sitting there, well, how did they get there, the acorns? Uh, there's no such thing as bog squirrels. Uh, that they don't exist. So Matthew Jeb in the Botanic Gardens, Owen Donnelly a Woodwright from Wexford, and John Lusby a Birdwatch Ireland. I cross reference with these guys, get some science on the case. And it would appear maybe it was a jay. But so the plot is kind of really ticking. We've got this 4,000 year old wood on one hand to make something out of, but I've also got about 150 young oak trees. That are that are that, and they all they all germinated. They all came up, and it's a very very interesting thing. As Matthew Jeb of the Botanic Garden says, it's an amazing story, and what you do with this story is really really important. You know how what biography, what story do we tell? Where are these planted? How do they make place? And how do we look after these trees to have them grow up in community? And and that, that's kind of they won't really grow well in North Mayo. <laughs> Um, so, but it, it's an interesting question. So, that's kind of where I'm at with the project. And this is also a moment that we, we got the core of the eye of this carbon dated. That's amazing. It's 4,329 years old, or before, pre yeah, before present. So, it's kind of that, that piece of wood there. That's the first year of growth of this tree that grew, f you know, that number of years ago. So we're just kind of, kind of trying to close the distance in those two things and just, you know, so, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to work it out, you know, but I'll, I'll try and work it out in place when I get back up there. So, um, yeah, no, that's, that's me for now. Thank you.